Yeah, uh, so, okay, good, I'm on. Um, so, yeah, first a little bit about me. Um, I'm not really an IT guy, I've just been pretending to be my entire career. Um, I'm actually a geographer, um, so, but I, I got a bit distracted somewhere along the way and got a job doing Unix and Linux and Solaris and, and web stuff for the money, which, which wasn't too bad, I like that part. Um, sometime in the past, back when I, I live in Switzerland now, um, I used to run www.boeing.com for roughly about 10 years, uh, and then as part of that, they, they wanted some database stuff with it, and uh, so I, I got into databases, um, and, and I, I kind of liked it, especially Postgres. Postgres is awesome. Uh, so when I, and one thing, when I started with databases way back in 1997, people told me that relational databases had no future. Um, and now we can laugh at that, right? So, um, the introduction to this, this is absolutely not an anti-high availability talk. Um, I mean, it, has, it definitely has its place, but I don't think it's needed everywhere. Um, and it also has its price, right? Both in the um, amount you have to provide for hardware and the expertise you need to have. But the, the idea of this talk is getting you to really really think about what you need and what you're putting into production, right? And, you know, if you're, if you're at a bank or someplace similar, maybe this isn't the talk for you, but then again, um, maybe you have some services internal to the bank um, for your developers and that, that, you know, don't need the HA services your, your big services need. Um, and, and one thing I always say is just nobody else has your data, right? Um, and this is, I've, I've learned it, nobody had my data, and I had problems that were different on that. Um, and, and to be honest, I, uh, you know, how many people have, you know, set up HA just because it's fun? I mean, I have, right? Yeah. Uh, you see at least a couple, good. Um, and, you know, and I'm retired now, and I, I still set up, like, Kubernetes at home, and, uh, you know, set up, you know, Postgres uh, operator, and it's, it's kind of a bit like playing SimCity, and then you go and remove data files, and you know it's like unleashing Godzilla. It's cool. Um, so, kind of the old way. So I worked at Boeing for many years, um, and of course, a few of you might know that we we made these airplanes. This is a cargo plane. Pretend it's a passenger plane. Um, and there used to be, well, it still is a rule that for the most part. If you have an engine with, uh, if you have an airplane with more or three, more than three engines, three or more engines, you can fly anywhere you want to. You can fly over oceans, whatever. Um, but having multiple engines like that, it's it's expensive, right? More hardware, uh, more things can go wrong. With a, you, know, you lose an engine, um, you know sometimes they fall off, and. Uh, but the, the hardware has gotten better over time. Um, I know I work for Boeing, and this is an Airbus, if you, you guys know what it is. But um, I live near the airport in Zurich, and this is what I had a good picture of. But the AC-30, of course, does, does ETOPS, right? Extended Twin Operations. Um, and it's also known as, in, in the business, as engines turn or passengers swim. The, the idea behind this is given if you, you build your aircraft a certain way and you test them out a certain way, you're allowed to fly further and further away from an airport that you can divert from. And, and so this has been really good because you can build cheaper airplanes um, and they're cheaper to operate. So HA, do you really need it? Um, what are your real uptime requirements? You should ask yourself these questions. How much data can you really lose? Um, in the past, it was losing data was, was horrible. It still is horrible. But there are cases where you might have to lose data. Um, or, if you, or there might be ways to mitigate this data loss. There might be zero data loss too, right? There are ways to do that. Um, 
is running degraded under acceptable under your, your service level agreement. One thing to think about. Can you use some outage time for maintenance under your SLA? And one thing, you know, if you're running HA, it might be hiding problems. It might look really good. Your HA config might be causing your system to fail over, and your monitoring might not be telling you about it. If your monitoring is through a different group, it's set up, they might have different requirements, and it might, might not tell you that you're having all sorts of problems while you actually are, right? If nobody is complaining, there aren't any problems. Um, but really, you have a responsibility to know what's going on. Um, even if it's, you know, the infrastructure team's re responsibility, somebody needs to know the entire stack. Because there might be single points of failure that the infrastructure team hasn't told you about. And, it, and in that case, why do you even bother with HA, right? Um, reasons you might not want HA. Maybe you want a simple architecture. Um, maybe, you know, you have an SLA that's best effort and office hours only. Maybe there's not a reason to run HA in that case. Maybe you're in interested more in your data integrity than your uptime. Um, maybe you don't have enough trained personnel. At the last couple of jobs, I've been like the, the database expert, um, and the other people haven't known so much. Um, and well, maybe you're just simply not planning to be around after the employment, like you're retiring like I did um, six months ago, eight months ago. Um, so. so availability, can you guys read this? I mean, I'll just go over it real quickly because, I mean, this is a, a talk in itself, right? So, and, so, and I'll, I'll make these slides available so you can read it. Um, anyways, the, uh, there's a nice table of availability values on Wikipedia. Um, everybody's talking about five nines, right? It's a great target. Uh, can you meet it? Yeah, yeah, you can meet it if you've got a lot of resources and a lot of skill. Um, and, and you have a, you know, a simple application. Uh, but in a lot of cases, you'll find that 98 is actually often contracted, right? 98%. And I had this case with, I had, I, I had some uh, co-location ISP, kind of like a, a hobby server, actually. And uh, they were taking it down. I was like, woohoo, I'll get a, get a refund in. Unfortunately, they had a 98% downtime uh, clause in there, and well, they were like, okay, it'll be back up soon. So, uh, and one of my commercial services actually had a contracted 98% uh, availability, but it um, actually, at the end of the year, it needed to really be there, so we watched it carefully then. Uh, then unplanned outages can greatly disrupt your availability, right? Uh, you know, when they happen off hours, if your AFCHA is set up and, and processes are really complex, right? Or when they happen when knowledgeable staff is away. So, you know, you, you might go on holiday, you've set up this really complex thing, and it breaks in there and they're calling you in and you end up spending more time than you would have spent to recover things if you'd had things just like as a simple uh, single system. Um, so as, as I was saying, co complexity in the HA setup can cause, cause more outages than you would have just by running a single instance on a single server VM. It's like more engines on the airplane, the more you have, the more likely any one of them will go bad. And then there's, I mean, no matter what you do, you, there are things you can't control. Um, for example, well, if you're not running your infrastructure directly, you either you know, got it hosted someplace or you have an internal infrastructure team that's re responsible for that, or your networking team is doing things, um, your, maybe your data center's caught on fire. I once had this happen. Um, I got a bunch of messages, all my systems were, were having problems, so I, I, I drove down to, to the data center, and there's a fire truck out in front. So that was pretty exciting. And then there's company budgeting, of course. 
Uh, and what, what's in the end, what's really important, right? Money, costs. Um, so just a, a quick background. Um, is everybody pretty much, is there anybody not familiar with the ACID properties and databases? Okay, so I, I can skip this. Just remember that it's your ACID properties in your databases are only for a single instance, right? So as soon as you start putting in a replication, you go to the cap theorem. And this is for multiple nodes. So as you have replication, uh, Eric Brewer is credited with this. In short, um, any multiple nodes database can only, only guarantee two of three of consistency, where reads are up to date and correct. Availability, we can always connect to the database service. Or partition tolerance, which will continue to run even if we're not up to date and not always in contact with the other nodes. To work around this, you have multi-active read-write database nodes will have some sort of a rectification mechanism to apply updates and sort out conflicts. Um, this isn't always perfect, and often you need manual intervention to do this. So always, and always read the fine print on any product that claims multi-active known synchronization. I, I was using a product, and it was not Postgres. It wasn't even a SQL database. But it, it claimed that, yeah, we have multiple write nodes. And in the end, it really was, it did. But you couldn't say, OK, commit to n number of nodes before you consider something committed. It would consider a commit as long as it got to one of the nodes, which is a little dodgy in my book. There's a good write-up on the uh, CAP theorem uh, at this link. And as I said, I'll provide the slides. Um, and this, as it was pointed out to me at the first time I gave this talk, uh, this has been super by uh, Letitia Avro. Um, it's been superseded by the pac calc theorem. But I still like the CAP theorem because it's, it's nice and succinct. Any questions so far? OK. Uh, eventual consistency. Um, this is always a big topic with, uh, with Postgres, right? Because we work on the idea of uh, eventual consistency. Your changes eventually will make it to the other nodes. Usually, it's pretty fast. But nodes can be out of sync. Um, and this, that's a lot of words there, but um, this can be mitigated by sitting the PostgreSQL.conf setting synchronous commit to remote write where the wall gets written to the remote server. Or uh, synchronous commit equals remote apply where it gets applied to the database. And it's actually, it's actually in the, this, you can query it. And by setting hot standby feedback on, do be aware that if you set this and you're down to two nodes, you will no longer be able to write to your database because, or one, one node, right? Or if you have the number of, hot, the number of standby set to uh, a certain number, you go below that number, then you will not be able to write. Uh, so I got ahead of myself there. A quorum of standby servers can be set, right, through uh, runtime config replication primary. The documentation is good on that. And I won't go into that because that, that's pretty deep. Um, and after you have to watch out after a certain period of the node being offline, you may end up with a split brain issue because you'll run out of um, write ahead log, right? It'll time out and the, the files won't be there anymore. It, you know, you could use something like, you know, PG backrest to catch things back up. But it's probably in that case just better off. You know, hopefully you're running in some place where you can you can equally easily nuke and pave the host. That's the troublemaker. It's behind. Um, it's important to set up an SLA with your management. The very first question I always ask of any management, anybody who's come to me for a database, is how much data are you willing to lose? You might be surprised. Because this is, this is really a cost question, right? And being able to recover data is much more important than having a backup somewhere there. 
And so depending on how much data you can lose, if you can lose up to a day's worth of data, you've, you can be pretty, pretty flexible on what you do, right? It's just a um, PG dump, you know, any of the other backup things. Uh, a filer snapshot would go, although I wouldn't do it today. Um, but you have to make sure to tell the filer or tell Postgres that you're backing up. You have to put it in, in backup mode. It's, I used to do that. I wouldn't do it anymore, though. Um, if, you can, if you can lose up to about a minute, now I'm not up to date on, on backrest right now. They may have changed this. Um, but they were, they were shipping the log, the archive logs over the wall uh, files and archiving them. Um, but it was whenever the uh, archive timeout hit. So, you know, you can set that down to a minute, but you'd still be a minute out of, out of sync, right? If you don't want any data loss, um, you, can, you can set up barman, and it, it works fairly well for this, and I've, I've done that. Um, or any anything that that would do um, streaming streaming a wall with the with the physical backup, and and again to make sure you don't lose any data, you have to have the remote write or a remote apply set for a synchronous commit, and then the hot standby feedback on, so the nodes know that the uh, commit has been applied everywhere. And and with you can. If you have a single Marman server, right? If it if it goes down, you can't write anymore. So it's it's useful to have multi multiple Marman servers if that's a requirement. And actually, you can put them in different places too, which is which which is uh, in different data centers, which is a cool thing to do. Of course, monitor your backups. It's important to know that they actually happen. Um, Verify your backups periodically, or much better yet, um, automate uh, data recovery tests and, and monitor that. And then turn on checksums, um, either in the database or if your file system or storage supports that. But it's always good to have it on in the database. OK, how long an outage can you survive? You, know, you want to ask this of your management or your customer. Um, if you have data loss requirements, of course, it's going to be pretty much as long as it takes, right? But if you have the ability to run in a read-only mode, you might be back a little quicker. Um, how much time do you need to recover, right? So if you can avoid failovers, it's good because they generally increase complexity. Um, Again, practice, practice recovering a backup of your production data in a test environment. Um, if you have a situation where you've got regulations that your security folks don't like to let you play with the production data and recover it, um, create a test environment someplace where you can do this. All right? So maybe you have to take a little you might have network set up, right? So you've got your production, which, which nobody accesses. Um, and maybe you can carve out a little spot for that. Um, time it to see how long it takes. Allow enough time to do practice runs on this so you know your processes are correct. So when an incident actually happens, you're not uh, panicking, right? And, and document all of this. Um, both for you know people that aren't you and, and for yourself because you forget this stuff and and it's it's good to have the documentation and get your management buy-in right you know your your management will come to you and say well we want this 24 by 7 by 365 and no data loss and unfortunately um, physics kind of gets in the way of that but uh, you can discuss the ma options with management and try to choose the right solution. I mean, in one case, um, my management wanted a, a multi-active. They, they're like, oh, we want that, you know, because they'd heard the buzzword, not because they knew actually what it meant. And I said, well, 
what do you think that means? And they're like, well, we, we want the, the database to be available five minutes after we lose one of the data centers. I said, yeah, that's no problem. Um, in another case, on one service, uh, a day's loss of data was acceptable. And that makes things a lot cheaper, right? Um, so a few scenarios to go through. Um, so single instances. Um, I've run a lot of single instance servers. They're not always a bad thing. Um, sometimes not even on the same server or VM with the, the application. Um, but if you're doing containers, you probably want to use some sort of operator in any case with containers. It, it's a lot easier in the end. Um, and, and this is fine for really simple applications with a very limited load. Um, and you don't want to build a giant server that you'll never use. So I had this, this ticketing system. And the, the guy running it before had proposed some, some huge storage array on it. And they needed you know, tons of CPU. And I basically tuned the database, and it went on a VM and included the application, right? You do need to make sure you have enough memory for everything on that server, though, because if you, if you don't, you might get you know, a memory or overcommit. And if your database gets swapped out, that's a horrible thing. Or, you know, OM killer comes and kills your database. Um, I could go into that, but if you want to hear some more stories, you can talk to me afterwards. Uh, and make sure to set up a replication-based backup. Not necessarily because it's, um, you know, it's, it's the best backup method. Backrest is pretty cool, and so is Marman. Um, but if you do this, then you don't have to go back and do the work to, to do this if you want to start doing replication. Or in the, in the case, you might migrate from hardware, and then it's easier to fire up a replica and promote that rather than, rather than fixing the system you have already. Um, sometimes multiple single instances might fit the requirements. I had this uh, system where it was logging, and it was OK to have two separate systems. It was log information. It was all there. So it was fine. Um, and it, it gave us a little bit more availability. Degraded service, or the read-only is, read is still available, right? Um, with some services, a read-only replica it will give you a degraded service, right? You, as long as you can look up tickets, that's useful. Maybe if you don't, uh, can't open new tickets, yeah, that, that's a problem, but uh, it's at least something. Uh, you can bring up another instance from the backup, but don't, don't allow a write. So create a new database, recover, and have it running until you figure out what problems you're having. Uh, total outages, of course, should, you should have a service outage page someplace. And you shouldn't wait until you have the problem to go try to find a hosting service for this. Uh, this is, how much time do we have? I think we're good. OK, so um, I had audit requirements. So there were other places I could find lost data if I lost it. So. Uh, we had application logs. We had query logs. Um, we had Elasticsearch that audited everything. So our, our data was in multiple places. So if you lost it, you could recreate it. Um, you know, developers would have their local copy of their code in the case of Git, uh, GitLab. Uh, ticketing system, you know, if you're having an outage, you can queue stuff back up in the mail queue, or you might have. Uh, some other queuing system that your, your data goes through first where you can keep the data for a while. Monitoring is important. Um, trend data is really important. Uh, I was working at a place where, where monitoring data was around for two weeks, which just simply wasn't enough. Um, really, you want 
six to 12 months uh, when I was working, supporting some universities, you would see seasonal changes in what resources you needed. And you were thinking, oh, I need more storage and then it would be Christmas time and you'd be fine. Um, monitoring service up down is not enough. Uh, it's good to have emails sent to you when issues pop up that don't need to be immediately taken care of and you know, maybe in the middle of the night, you don't need to be woken up for stuff if you're on call. Uh, again, be sure to monitor the backup jobs, index rebuilds, um, slow queries. Uh, and Greg Stark had a good talk on the PG stat packages extensions. Um, you want all of that data from like PG stat statements and those. Uh, performance tuning, um, you can get rid of a lot of problems and when you make sure you have the indexes you really need. Um, I've got a great war story about this, um, but suffice to say, if you don't have the right indexes, you know, you might end up adding tons of hardware that you don't need. Same with making sure that your PostgreSQL.conf has sane settings. Uh, make sure that your writes are safe, right? So it's going through at least to the, um, if not to the disk, if you're on a filing a filer, like a NetApp filer, uh, make sure it's going to battery backed cache. And then make sure your OS is properly tuned. Connection handling is important. And this, this can be good with database connects and errors and rollbacks, right? Um, so if you've got your connection handling set up and to slightly go ahead, your application is handling things correctly, you can use something like PG Bouncer to kind of take you over real short outages. Like if you just restart Postgres, uh, the application might not see that if it handles things correctly. However, um, if you've ever tried going back to kind of the whole SimCity thing again, um, I was using a Postgres operator and I, just for fun, I was, I was pointing PG Bench at it and then um, breaking the various database nodes and having it fail over. And when the uh, database, one of the replicas got promoted, uh, PG Bench would crash and, and give me an error, which I, it would have been cool if it would have handled that, right? But that's not what PG Bench is for, so. Um, actually, application handling. If you can, you can't always, right? But if you can, work with your developers and vendors to make sure that their applications handle disconnection, transaction errors, and rollbacks in a sane manner. Um, if you've been running databases, I'm sure you've all uh, experienced badly performing applications. Um, really, if possible, application, if you're using PG Bouncer, should be supporting its transaction mode because you get a lot more out of it, right? Um, frameworks sometimes support transactions in the same manner, sometimes not. Um, if your developers use a framework, make sure that you all understand what's going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, ORMs uh, create some, some pretty interesting SQL, right? And if you don't know the, the query you're making, it, it can be tough. So, um, a few other notes. It's, it's always too good to host on some sort of VM if you can, right? Um, for the most part, it, it gives you abstraction from the hardware. Uh, this, can be, this can be great if you're if you need to upgrade your hardware or replace your hardware, uh, you might have some sort of live migration where you just move things over and you don't, you're not impacted by any sort of outage. You might have some, you might have some transactions hold up for a bit, but really it, it's, it's pretty good. Or you're upgrading memory, all these things that you might have to take an outage for, you don't. It's, it, 
Um, it's a little bit of overhead, but yeah. Um, use orchestration for your setup, right? Something like Ansible or Terraform or have your setups in a GitLab pipeline. Um, you know, these, these make your operations well-defined and repeatable. If you're in an environment like Iowa's where you're heavily audited, um, you just hand over your, your Ansible code and you're done with your audit, which, which is really nice. It's worth the extra effort to do that. If you can take some downtime for maintenance, um, consider insurance to keep your over, uh, overall uptime good. Don't let things get out of um, sync with updates and patches too long. It's also good to get your, do your maintenance in small chunks. You know, take a short outage just to do some start stuff like restart the DB. Um, it's much worth to get caught with a lot of complicated changes to make all at once. So, uh, so, so a couple of examples of, of these systems. Um, so I had this when I worked at Switch, which is a national research and education network for Switzerland. Uh, we had this application called File Sender, and what this did was if you have a large file that you want to email somebody, but it's like you know 20, 50 gigabytes, it won't go through email. So you upload the file, it sends a leak to the recipient, and they can just click on it. And it's a pretty simple database. It just keeps track of the files, it keeps track of uh, senders and recipients, it keeps track of um, how long the file should be up there. And in, in this case, it was just a single instance on a fairly small VM with a lot of storage, of course. And, uh, they, the database ran on the same VM as well. And uh, we almost never had any downtimes with it. It was really reliable. But then again, simple application, right? Um, central database for developer uh, applications. So this was your GitLab, Jira, Confluence, et cetera. That was on a single node. And I had that working with PG Bouncer and Barman. And this, this worked really good. Originally, I'd set it up um, as a three-node cluster with a uh, replication manager, which I thought really worked really well. Um, but the, the infrastructure team needed to do patches, and they did the patches simultaneously on all nodes, which um, wrecked havoc with my, uh, <laughs> my database. And it's like, well, you know, after two or three times of having to go and manually redo things, I was like, well, maybe Barman does answers our, our data retention problem, and uh, you know, so we don't lose data, and uh, we just go with a single node, and that, that worked great. And it, I handed that over to the infrastructure team, and it, it just kept on running, and they never bothered me about it, so that was good. Um, and then there's, you know, if you're running HA, you know, you have, I had problems with HA um, in Kubernetes. So what can happen there is um, my coworker and dividing my databases, and it was all gone. So that was, that was pretty bad. <laughs> um, I think it was, that wasn't production though, so fortunately. So, uh, in summary, uh, try to keep think things as simple as you can. Um, don't do an HA complex HA setup unless you have to and will benefit from it. I mean, if you have to, um, it's great. It works well. And if you have the resources, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of the Postgres replication and, and the HA stuff and uh, the... The, the Kubernetes uh, Postgres operators. I, I think it's wonderful stuff. It's fun to play with. It's fun to work with. Uh, and, you know, handled in the right way, it's, it's very reliable. Uh, but it's, you're, you're putting a lot of effort into it. Um, if your data is important, uh, protect it. Use the tools, uh, tools available to set up zero data loss if you need that. 
Um, you probably have some downtime in your SLA. Use it if you can. Uh, use monitoring to catch issues before they become outages. And, and technology is always changing, right? So I'm not sure I'd be giving this talk next year, maybe. Uh, but the Postgres core keeps on getting a lot better, as do all the tools in the community, right? We learn more you know, as time goes on. So uh, thanks for attending. Um, sometimes it's better not to use too many resources to do what you really want to get done. And uh, so questions? So we, we've got plenty of time for questions, so think of something. So there's some examples you have of like where it was uh, worthwhile you needed like five nines. Pardon? And there's some examples of where you really needed like five nines availability. When I really needed? Five nines availability. Uh, high availability? Where's, the, where's so an like, example? Like at the top end, you know? The yeah, top end. Um, so, yeah, so um, I worked on this authentication system, right? So it used national, kind of a national authentication system. Um, so people use it instead of passwords to like connect to the post office and that. And that really needed to be up all the time. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't directly Postgres, but it's a good, that was an example, right? Um, you know, the, the DNS servers we had, things like that. I think it's, I, I love your talk, because I've been working on HA in my company for the past five years, mm -hmm. and I hate HA. I'm anti-HA, I think. No, I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying that, I'm just kidding, but uh, I think it's very important to maybe educate our clients, our management, to the fact that HA isn't the solution to everything, and that, um, like you, you touched on it, right? You said that management wanted to have an active, active or multi-active setup, but what they really needed is a downtown, a, a downtime, sorry, that was less than five minutes in case yeah. the, the primary had an outage. And I think it's really important to go back, to always go back to what the client really needs, because often what the client will come with is not uh, their need, but a, a solution. I want you to um, set up an HA um, solution, but y you, I, I think there's a lot of educating to do on our side uh, to make sure that we understand the context, the need, and uh, yeah, make sure, like you said, not too much resource is put where y you just maybe need a VM sometimes. Yeah, and I, I think a, a lot of us, um, well, I shouldn't talk for anybody else, but I, I know, you know, I, I think these HA solutions are really cool, and when you get the chance to put one into production, it's fun, right? Um, but on the other side, you know, it's like where I was working, I had to make sure that because I was, you know, I was planning on retiring, I couldn't just leave them with this big complex setup that they, they wouldn't be able to support, and, and, and that's important. So... But I think, yeah, it's, a lot of it's also that we need to, we need to realize that you know not everything is an opportunity to do the coolest work, right? It's like old technology is sometimes not, not bad, except of course when it comes to a new version of Postgres, that's that's all right, right? Because that's that's been that's actually been pretty pretty thoroughly tested. It's been a long time since they've had any problems with a new version that I'm aware of, like ten years, I think. Any more questions from people? Uh, is there anything else you want to add, Greg, or do you want to... Anything else you want to talk about? Or? Anything else I wanted to talk about? I've got a little bit of time, but um, I think I'm mostly... Yeah, I think it's, it, it's probably pretty good, yeah. Um, oh, we have there we go. 
considering the example you gave before of a client wanting just a downtown of let's less, not more than five minutes, um, would you do that with a single node setup or you still need a replication or something? For like a, just a, down, a downtime of five minutes? Uh, not more than five minutes, until something fails over and resumes or whatever. Um, what, exactly, what was the question again? Can I have that with a single node cluster? Without having human intervention, you know, at night, I want to stay still sleeping, not being woken up, having to go and to resume server whatsoever, you know? Oh, that you'd, you'd, get a, um, you'd get a message or it went down for five minutes and it wakes you up? Normally, that's what happen. But uh, what I want is to, that it will resume or somehow or it fails over their node or something. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. I mean, you know, you can, you can have uh, the monitoring test a number of times and you can have thresholds, right? And then, you know, I might say, okay, the, the typical thing that happens with that is you have an outage that's, you know, within a certain threshold and it fails a couple of times and then it doesn't do anything, right? And they don't send you any information. They just say, oh, this is good. But in that case, you could have a test that said, okay, well, um, you know, for these, within this threshold, we send email. And if it's something that's like really bad, then, then it wakes you up. Anything else anybody wants to talk about? In which case, uh, give Greg a big round of applause, please. And, uh... Thank you.